Good evening and welcome. Tonight I'm going to be reading to you some articles out of History Magazine. And in February in the United States, we celebrate Black History Month. So I'm going to read to you some articles about some incredible black figures in history. You can see Harriet Tubman right here. We'll get to her story in a minute. But first I want to read this article, probably about someone you may not have heard of. This is Olauda Ekwano. And this article was actually requested by one of my channel members. It was requested by all the happy squirrels. My channel members get to pick which articles I read. And if you would like to pick an article, you can click the join button right down there. Or if you're on mobile and it's not visible, you can click the link in the description box. It'll be the first link. It's only 99 US cents per month. And one of the many perks is that you get to pick History Magazine articles. And now is the time to join because I'll be getting a new issue next week, like in a few days after this video comes out. And the new request video will be out not long after that. So now is the time to join if you want a say in March's video and have your name shouted out and everything. But let's get into the articles. We are starting with Lauda Equano, Scribe Against Slavery. Its title appears unassuming, but its impact is undeniable. Published in 1789, the interesting narrative of the life of Alauda Equano, or Gustavus Vasa the African, is a two-volume autobiography that became one of the most important works of the late 18th century and a foundational text in the fight against slavery. Equano's interesting narrative is the first book-length narrative by an enslaved person. It is the prototype for a genre that developed in the 19th century, culminating in Frederick Douglass's 1845 autobiography. His and other testimonies by formerly enslaved people are the very foundation upon which most subsequent Afro-American fictional and non-fictional narrative forms are based, wrote African-American scholar Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Birth of a Best Seller Equano's book was immensely popular when it was published in England. Volume 1 describes Equano's childhood in what is now Nigeria, his kidnapping, his brutal Atlantic crossing, and his enslavement and experiences in the West Indies. Volume 2 recounts how he achieved his freedom, his life as an entrepreneur and adventurer, his religious conversion, and his life in England, which focuses on his campaign for the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, an event he never lived to see. Readers were taken by the story of how, in 1756, 11-year-old Equano and sister were seized by enslavers and taken from their Igbo home. The siblings were separated, sold repeatedly in West Africa, then reunited. She and I held one another by the hands all night, he wrote, and thus for a while we forgot our misfortunes and the joy of being together. The next day they were separated again, this time forever. There are few first-person accounts by Africans of the Middle Passage, the journey across the Atlantic from West Africa. Equano's memoir captures the agony of the experience indelibly. The ship, which was so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself, almost suffocated us. This produced copious perspirations, so that the air soon became unfit for respiration, from a variety of loathsome smells, and brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many died. Upon arrival in Barbados, Equano wrote that he was taken to Virginia, 
and sold to a local planter. After about a month, he was purchased by Michael Henry Pascal, a Royal Navy officer, who brought Equano to London and renamed him Gustavus Vasa, an ironic homage to the 16th century Swedish king who freed his country from Danish tyranny. While serving Pascal, Equano fought in naval battles during the Seven Years' War. In 1763, Equano was purchased by Robert King, a Quaker merchant from Philadelphia, for whom he acted as a clerk, working on trading sloops around the Caribbean. Equano witnessed shocking brutality toward enslaved Africans throughout the West Indies and North America, and he spoke with many which may have provided him with the data that he used to write the Middle Passage narrative. Meanwhile, King allowed Equano to conduct his own trading, which eventually earned him enough money to purchase his freedom in 1766. In the following years, he lived a life of trade and adventure, traveling to North America, the Mediterranean, the West Indies, and the Arctic, where he took part in a failed attempt to find a northern passage to India. Zeal for Change After experiencing a spiritual awakening in 1774, Equano converted to Methodism, inspired by its abolitionist leader, John Wesley. From the mid-1780s, a movement calling for an end to the slave trade began to emerge. Equano was its leading black campaigner. In 1788, he presented Queen Charlotte, wife of King George III, with a petition on behalf of my African brethren, in which he supplicated, Your Majesty's compassion for millions of my African countrymen who groan under the lash of tyranny in the West Indies. That same year he hailed the Slave Trade Act, by which the British Parliament regulated the maximum number of enslaved people who could be transported on a ship. The oppression and cruelty exercised to the unhappy Negroes there have at length reached the British legislature, he said. It was the interesting narrative, however, that put Equano front and center. Wesley, the Methodist abolitionist, brought the book to the attention of William Wilberforce, who led the movement in the House of Commons to abolish the African transatlantic slave trade. Feminist Mary Wollstonecraft gave the book a mostly positive review, though she thought it focused too much on Aquano's conversion. Equano makes it very clear that the book is as much a political petition as an autobiography. In the introduction, addressing the two Houses of Parliament with the greatest deference and respect, he states his chief design is to excite in your august assemblies a sense of compassion for the miseries which the slave trade has entailed. The book's first printing of some 700 copies sold out quickly. Over 300 subscribers bought copies prior to publication for the first edition, and by the last edition there were close to 2,000. Among prominent readers were the Prince of Wales, who was the future King George IV, many other aristocrats, and leading abolitionists Josiah Wedgwood, Thomas Clarkson, and Granville Sharp. Equano had turned to Sharp in 1783 to protest the massacre on the slave ship Song, an atrocity that helped fuel the abolition movement. The two-volume work was translated into German, Dutch, and Russian, and it even found an audience in the United States. Equano constantly drummed up support for the abolitionist cause in any way he could giving lectures and participating in public debates. Together with other Africans in Britain, he co-founded the abolitionist group Sons of Africa. At age 52, Aquano died in 1797, before the slave trade ended in Britain. It was not until 1807 that Britain abolished it. Enslaved people in British colonies were finally emancipated in 1834. 
question of birth. Equano's eyewitness testimony of the horrors of the transatlantic slave trade was at the root of the book's emotional power, but modern scholarship has called some of its claims into question. Vincent Corrido, professor emeritus at the University of Maryland and author of Equano the African, edited a 1995 edition of the interesting narrative. He found baptismal and naval records dating that Aquano was born in South Carolina around 1747. That would mean his equal childhood and much quoted account of the Middle Passage were inventions. The evidence is not definitive, Coretta says, but has to be taken into account. If it is true, Aquano's literary achievements have been greatly underestimated. It makes it more interesting if we consider the possibility he created an African identity, which was exactly what was needed in the 1780s, Coretta says. Aquano was aware of the need. You had pro-slavery people saying, if it was so bad, why do we not hear about enslaved Africans complaining? People he was corresponding with said we need to hear a first-person victim's account. Other historians dispute the claim, while still recognizing the quality of Coretta's scholarship. The rest of Equano's narrative contains no other discrepancies. To historian Adam Hotchild, the pattern indicates Equano's African birth is most likely true. In his book, Bury the Chains, Hodgechild writes, Seldom is one crucial portion of a memoir totally fabricated and the remainder scrupulously accurate among autobiographers. Both dissemblers and truth-tellers tend to be consistent. The impact of Equano's writing, whether part fiction or holy fact, cannot be understated. His compelling story opened people's eyes to the horrors inflicted on humanity a key early step in the march to end slavery. What a fascinating, tragic, but so fascinating of a person, right? Amazing. Let's put this aside and let's read about Harriet the Spy. about Harriet Tubman, probably like the most famous like non-living black woman in American history. I feel like when you think of great black women in America, you think like Oprah and you know, Beyonce. But um, probably the one with the most important lasting legacy is Harriet. So let's read about her life. Any student of American history is no stranger to Harriet Tubman. Called the Moses of her people, Tubman famously escaped slavery herself in 1849 and then returned to guide family and friends to freedom along the Underground Railroad. She freed dozens of people through her work in the 1850s. Perhaps her most significant but less celebrated contributions came during the Civil War and she worked for the Union as a nurse, soldier, and spy. Tubman's skills and abilities, honed in the backwoods of Maryland as she spirited people north, were crucial to penetrating slaveholding power in South Carolina and delivering a devastating blow to the Confederacy. In one night, she led a mission that freed hundreds. Growing up, the middle child of nine siblings, Tubman was born in Dorchester County on Maryland's eastern shore around 1882. Her parents, Harriet Ritt Green and Ben Ross, named their daughter Arminta. Both Ritt and Ben were enslaved, as were all their children. Tubman later recalled how Ritt often told her children Bible stories, which led to Tubman's deep, lifelong Christian faith. As early as age five, Araminta began being hired out for work in other households. In her own telling, it was a brutal experience, full of violence and physical abuse at the hands of her enslavers. She later remembered how one mistress would whip her almost every morning before work. Another incident in which she was hit in the head with a lead weight 
left her with a serious injury. She would be plagued for the rest of her life by painful headaches and debilitating seizures. As a child, Araminta often worked in domestic settings, caring for children, cooking, and cleaning. After she turned 12, Araminta moved outside to work in the fields. She was not tall, but she was very strong, able to lift heavy barrels, chop wood, and till the soil. When Araminta was in her early 20s, she married John Tubman, a free black man, and changed her name to Harriet. Even though her husband was free, Harriet Tubman was not. Like most enslaved people, she and her family were in constant risk of being split up if their owners decided to sell. Spreading Freedom Harriet Tubman's successful escape in 1849 was fueled by such fears. Her enslaver, Edward Brodus, died suddenly, and there were rumors that his widow was going to sell Tubman and her siblings. Rather than let the widow decide her fate, Tubman struck out on her own and found her way north to Philadelphia. For the next 11 years, Tubman did her best known work in the causes of freedom and human rights. She became an important figure in abolitionist circles, although she was not fond of public speaking, and became allies with prominent anti-slavery figures, including noted speaker Frederick Douglass and the radical John Brown so admired her bravery and tactics that he called her General Tubman. Through her leadership on the Underground Railroad, Tubman returned south to Maryland many times and rescued more than 70 enslaved people, including members of her own family. She helped them relocate to free states like Pennsylvania and New York, and even farther north to Canada. Known as Moses, Tubman relied on careful planning and information networks. Tubman was familiar with the Maryland landscape, rivers, and night sky, which helped her navigate north. She shrewdly began journeys on Saturday nights, since runaway notices could not appear in local newspapers until Monday. She carried a pistol, both for protection from slave catchers and to urge her passengers forward if they decided to turn back. You'll be free or die, she said. Later in her life, Tubman proudly recalled, I was the conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors can't say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. War efforts After the Civil War broke out in April 1861, Tubman volunteered her services to the Union. As a volunteer, she initially joined Major General Benjamin Butler and his Massachusetts troops, who were stationed at Fort Monroe, Virginia. Tubman's duties there were largely domestic. She worked as a nurse, cook, and laundress. That May, a group of black Americans fled their Virginia enslavers and took refuge at Fort Monroe. Early in the war, there was no universal approach about what to do with refugees like them, but General Butler took an aggressive stance. The Union was at war with the Confederacy, which meant that he could seize the property, including enslaved people, of enemies of the state. Butler referred to the escapees as contraband of war and refused to turn over anybody who had fled from slavery and come to Fort Monroe. Contrabands, as they became known, would stay at the garrison. Four months into the war, there were more than a thousand of them living and working alongside Tubman. In late 1861, Tubman returned to New England and Auburn, New York, to spend the winter and visit with her parents. They had escaped Maryland in the 1850s and settled in New York with Tubman and other family members. She looked forward to returning to the work at Fort Monroe and helping build the free black community there in the spring, but Massachusetts Governor John Andrew had different plans. The Union had captured Port Royal, South Carolina, in early November 1861. The Barrier Island was an important strategic gain, giving the Union naval control. 
naval control of Port Royal Sound and the Sea Islands. Like Fort Monroe, Port Royal and the surrounding Beaufort area had become a haven for enslaved people fleeing the coastal plantations of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Governor Andrew asked Tubman to travel to Port Royal to aid the growing refugee community there in the Sea Islands. Tubman welcomed the new assignment, and after getting her affairs in order at home, she departed in May 1862. Freedom Fighters When the war began in April 1861, free black people had limited opportunities to contribute to the war effort, especially on the battlefield. Despite having fought for independence in 1776 and in the War of 1812, black Americans were excluded from fighting for the Union. This perplexing stand was largely because of politics. Many Republican leaders wanted abolition, but President Lincoln feared that the so-called border states, where slavery remained legal, would secede if the issue took center stage. Critics, including Tubman, loudly pointed out the obvious contradiction with this position. Frederick Douglass noted in May 1861, just a month into the war, there is but one easy, short, and effectual way to suppress and put down the desolating war. Fire must be met with water, darkness with light, and war for the destruction of liberty must be met with war for the destruction of slavery. Following the precedent set by General Butler at Fort Monroe, Congress took a step forward by passing the first Confiscation Act, of August 1861. The act made it the Union's policy to seize property, including enslaved people, supporting the Confederate military. A few short months later, Secretary of War Simon Cameron was publicly advocating that all contrabands should be unconditionally freed and allowed to enlist in the armed forces. Lincoln still resisted this position, despite critics loudly proclaiming the practicality and necessity of allowing black people to fight. Douglas knew that this investment would be key to future citizenship battles. But once let the black man get upon his purse in the brass letters U.S., let him get an eagle on his button, and a musket on his shoulder, and bullets in his pocket, and there is no power on earth which can deny that he has earned the right to citizenship in the United States. That's a really good point. As the war dragged on, abolitionist voices grew louder and louder. Tubman's was among them. Her support of Lincoln had been lukewarm at best because of his cautious approach to slavery. Tubman wanted a quick, complete end to slavery, and felt that the war was unwinnable unless abolition was the law of the land. She told a friend, God won't let Mr. Lincoln beat the South till he does the right thing. Union casualties mounted, and the U.S. government's attitude began to shift in 1862, when Republican senators observed that it was time for the military to use all the physical force of this country to put down the rebellion. Two acts passed in July 1862, loosening regulations. Persons of African descent could now be employed for any war service for which they may be found competent, although permission had to be secured for combat. The legislation also declared the enslaved people of anyone serving in the Confederacy forever free. Both acts laid the groundwork for the Emancipation Proclamation. It would be issued on September 22, 1862, and go into effect on January 1st, 1863. All enslaved people in the Confederate States are and henceforward shall be free. The proclamation also settled the question. The proclamation also settled the question of who could fight for the Union. Black American men could enlist in the Army and Navy joining the fight. 
When the U.S. Army decided to let black Americans fight, volunteer black regiments arose in Tennessee, Massachusetts, Kansas, and South Carolina. Two Union colonels, Thomas Wentworth Higginson and James Montgomery, would command two of these regiments. They arrived in South Carolina, where Tubman was stationed. Both men were staunch abolitionists before the war and familiar with Tubman's work. Higginson knew her well, for he had met her in Massachusetts, and Montgomery knew her by reputation through their colleague, John Brown. Both men quickly saw what an asset they had in her as a teammate. During her first ten months in South Carolina, Tubman had been mostly nursing the sick. Now the colonels wanted her to be more actively involved. Because of her experience guiding people on the Underground Railroad, the officers asked Tubman to form and lead a spy network in the region. Tubman was willing, and her experience made her the perfect person to launch the network. Her biographer, Catherine Clinton, wrote, Tubman had established such clandestine networks in the Upper South during her Underground Railroad days, and felt confident she might make similar headway in wartime Carolina. Tubman built a team of spies with many recruits from the local area around Beaufort. Her crew included Solomon Gregory, Mott Blake, Peter Burns, Gabriel Cahern, George Chisholm, Isaac Hayward, Walter Plowden, Charles Simmons, and Sandy Suffice. This group collected intelligence from not only South Carolina, but also farther north in Georgia and Florida. Sorry, farther south in Georgia and Florida. These spies would gather information from local enslaved people about Confederate plans, like where Confederate troops placed gunpowder-filled barrels in waterways to damage Union crafts. Information gained from these spies became known as Black Dispatches. Raiding the Rebels This early work led to Tubman's most daring mission, Working with her commander, Colonel Montgomery, the two planned an operation to raid Confederate supplies and homes along the Combahee River. Three ships and 300 Union soldiers left late in the evening of June 1, 1863, to sail up the river under the cover of darkness into the Low Country. Tubman's careful planning and intelligence gathering allowed the boats to avoid Confederate mines and slip by undetected. In the early morning hours of June 2nd, the Union forces attacked, wrecking havoc on the rice plantations along the river. Tubman led her own raiding party of eight men, helping to liberate enslaved people and seize whatever resources they could. Tubman later recalled how people seemed to drop what they were doing when they realized the Yankees were there. Alright, it's written in her dialect, so... I'm just reading what it says, okay? It says, I never see such a sight. Here you'd see a woman with a pail on her head. Rice is smoking in it, just as she'd taken from the fire. One woman brought two pigs, a white one and a black one. We took them all on board, named the white pig Beauregard and the black pig Jeff Davis. The raid was an unqualified success, striking a strong blow to one of the South's most important economic engines. Tubman estimated that she recruited around 100 soldiers from the refugees. Newspapers buzzed with accounts of the raid and its leaders, including Tubman. A Boston newspaper, the Commonwealth, trumpeted, Colonel Montgomery and his gallant band of 300 black soldiers under the guidance of a black woman, dashed into the enemy's country, struck a bold and effective blow, destroying millions of dollars worth of commissary stores, cotton and lordly dwellings, and striking terror into the heart of rebeldom, brought off near 800 slaves and thousands of dollars worth of property, without losing a man or receiving a scratch. Tubman also described her triumph in a letter she dictated to a friend. 
we weakened the rebels somewhat on the Combahee River by taking and bringing away some 756 head of their most valuable livestock, known up in your region as contrabands, and this too without a single loss of life on our part, though we had good reasons to believe that a number of rebels bit the dust. She sounds like a fascinating person to talk to. It was a moment of triumph for Tubman, who many historians believe as the first American woman to lead troops in an armed attack. She would spend the summer helping the newly freed Americans begin their lives in Port Royal. By the fall, Tubman's health had begun to wane, and she was granted leave to return to Auburn in spring 1864. She went back in March 1865, treating the wounded and sick in Virginia hospitals near Fort Monroe. Even after General Lee's surrender at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9th, Tubman continued her work in the region, treating the sick and wounded through July before going back to New York for good. Life After the War Tubman's devotion to civil rights and humanitarian issues continued for decades after the war. On the national front, she worked for women's suffrage, while in Auburn she opened her home to those in need, especially formerly enslaved people. Tubman's first husband died in 1851, leaving her free to remarry in 1869. Her second husband was a war veteran, 25-year-old Nelson Davis. In 1874, they adopted a daughter named Gertie. Tubman and her husband ran a seven-acre farm and a brick-making business together until his death in 1888. Despite her generosity, Tubman often lacked money. Her community in Auburn rallied around her. A white friend, Sarah H. Bradford, worked with Tubman on her biography in 1869, which earned roughly $1,200. In the 1880s, Tubman and Bradford published a new edition entitled Harriet, the Moses of Her People. During Reconstruction, Tubman began a decades-long battle to obtain a military pension for her service during the Civil War. It would be a slow process, taking tremendous determination, before the government granted one in 1899. It was both a sign of the times and of the long struggle that would follow Reconstruction into the 20th century, as the nation backslid into another era of racial discrimination. Tubman continued to fight for equality and fairness until her death in 1913. Hundreds attended her funeral in Auburn. She was buried with military honors in Fort Hill Cemetery, where her husband, brother, and father also rested. On the back of her headstone read a simple list of her accomplishments. Heroine of the Underground Railroad, nurse and scout in the Civil War, and servant of God, well done. Let's look at some of these pictures because they're fascinating. We got some postage stamps here with her on them. Black heritage. Very done. Here's a great photo of her family. This is her right here. This is Gertie, and this was her husband. What was his name? Nelson Davis. And other members of the family here. This is paperwork for getting her pension, but it's important not just because of what it is, but it has her signature on it. How cool is that? Harriet Tubman. That's amazing. A cool map here of the Combahee River Raid. There's Port Royal, Beaufort. They went up the waters here. And attacked there. And here's some artwork depicting it. You can see the rice fields and all the enslaved people running out, jumping into the waters, running toward this big gunboat, I guess, the American flag. Here's Colonel Montgomery. Oh, here's a bigger map. I didn't even notice this. Where you can see north and south. You can see there's Fort Monroe. And the area featured which where the attack happened is right there. Can you see? Oh my goodness. Right there. Kind of near where Georgia is. Huh? This is the Combahee River today. Isn't it beautiful? 
But what's striking is that it talks about in this box here that the plantations were abandoned after the, the attack. And you can kind of see the outlines of rice paddies here being taken back by nature. How fascinating is that? All of this would have been rice plantation. How incredible. There's Abe Lincoln here signing the Emancipation Proclamation. Black soldier here on this poster. It says, make way for liberty. And this is also fascinating. Some photographs of black soldiers here. Kind of a spoiler when you're reading this about how they weren't allowed to fight. These pictures right here. But, um, man, just incredible. This is the house where she lived in Auburn. It's down here, well, a first edition copy of her biography, Harriet, the Moses of her people. Uh, old timey, old 1862, old timey. Uh, Fort Monroe there on that peninsula. Very famous photograph of Harriet Tubman. And this is some of the waters in Maryland where she was born and grew up and probably had to wade through to get people to freedom. There's a little crib here. It's, this is in the Harriet Tubman Museum, but it's not necessarily her cradle, but it's one that she would have been cradled in when she was little, just like that. And then of course we have this beautiful artwork here. It says it's in the Smithsonian. Here, right there. It's so bright and strange the sun rising behind it. I love this. And then lastly over here is a little souvenir from the 1950s that was for sale at the Harriet Tubman Room. So that's the story of Harriet Tubman. I have one more story for you as a surprise because there's another great story here. This is about Dr. Charles Drew, father of the blood bank. Let's read about him. There he is. In the late 1930s, people could donate blood, but very few hospitals could store it for later use. Whole blood breaks down quickly, and there were no protocols at the time for safely preserving it. As a result, hospitals often did not have the appropriate blood type, and patients needed it. Charles Drew, a black surgeon and researcher, helped solve this monumental problem for medicine, earning him the title father of the blood bank. In 1938, while obtaining his doctorate in medicine, Drew became a fellow at Columbia University's prestigious Presbyterian Hospital in New York. He studied the storage and distribution of blood, including the separation of its components, and applied his findings to an experimental blood bank at the hospital. His revolutionary work led to the discovery of methods for safely and effectively processing and preserving blood, and his recommendation that hospitals create their own blood banks. Drew then directed the Blood for Britain campaign in 1940, which successfully sent much-needed blood plasma, the portion of blood that contains no cells and lasts longer, overseas. Shortly after, as the United States prepared to enter World War II, he drew on that experience to organize what became the first U.S. National Blood Bank. His discoveries and his leadership saved countless lives. Path to Medicine Drew was born on June 3, 1904, in segregated Washington, D.C., to middle-class parents who stressed education and responsibility. The oldest of five children, Drew showed maturity and ingenuity at an early age. At 12, he was selling newspapers from the street corner. By 13, he had six newspaper boys working for him. He attended Paul Lawrence Dunbar High School, a nationally recognized black high school in the city. He was considered bright, but he excelled more in athletics than in schoolwork lettering in four sports. After graduating in 1922, he attended Amherst College in Massachusetts on an athletic scholarship, 
where he was one of only 13 black students in a class of 600. He and his black teammates routinely faced hostility from opposing teams and were refused service at restaurants when they traveled for games. Drew was also denied captainship of the football team in his senior year because of his race, even though he was the school's best athlete. As an undergraduate, Drew became interested in medicine and was encouraged by a biology professor to pursue it. By the time Drew graduated in 1926, he knew he wanted to attend medical school. To afford it, he worked for the next two years as an athletic director and a biology and chemistry teacher at Morgan College in Baltimore, Maryland. When choosing a medical school, race limited Drew's options. Most black medical students at the time attended either Howard University in Washington, D.C., or Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. Drew was rejected from his first choice, Howard, and accepted but deferred from Harvard University, which only took a few non-white students each year. Anxious to begin, Drew decided to attend McGill University's Faculty of Medicine in Montreal, Canada. In 1933, he graduated second in his class of 137 students. Transfusion Medicine. After graduation, Drew took an internship and surgical residency at Montreal General Hospital, where his interest in transfusion medicine was born. Blood transfusions had only become widely used 30 years earlier, with the discovery of the four basic groups of blood type antigens, A, B, AB, and O. Drew returned to Washington, D.C., and taught pathology at Howard University College of Medicine. He was also a surgical instructor and chief surgical resident at Freedmen's Hospital. In 1938, Drew began postgraduate work at New York's Columbia University and he was awarded a prestigious fellowship at Presbyterian Hospital. He studied under John Scudder, who had been granted funding to set up an experimental blood bank to study the storage and distribution of blood. Drew's work with Scudder became the basis for his 1940 dissertation, Banked Blood, a study in blood preservation, in which he reported their findings for the long-term storage of plasma. Scudder called Drew's thesis a masterpiece. It would form the basis of Drew's major innovations to come. Wartime needs As Drew was finishing his degree at Columbia, World War II was erupting in Europe. Great Britain was asking the United States for desperately needed plasma to help victims of the Blitz. Given his expertise, Drew was selected to be the medical director for the Blood for Britain campaign. Using Presbyterian Hospital's blood bank as a template, Drew established uniform procedures and standards for collecting blood and processing blood plasma from nine New York hospitals and sending the plasma safely overseas. The five-month campaign collected donations from 15,000 Americans and was deemed a success. With the increasing likelihood that the nation would be drawn into war, the United States wanted to capitalize on what Drew had learned from the campaign. He was recruited as the assistant director of a three-month pilot program to mass-produce dried plasma in New York which became the model for the first Red Cross blood bank. His innovations for this program included mobile blood donation stations, later called bloodmobiles. Ironically, Drew was initially forbidden to participate in the program he created because the U.S. military refused to allow the Red Cross to accept donations from black Americans. After protests from the black press and the NAACP, the policy changed in 1942 
to allow black people to donate, but it still required all blood to be segregated. Categorizing the policy as unscientific and insulting, Drew resigned his position in 1942. It is fundamentally wrong for any great nation to willfully discriminate against such a large group of its people, he later said. One can say quite truthfully that on the battlefields, nobody is very interested in where the plasma comes from when they are hurt. It is unfortunate that such a worthwhile and scientific bit of work should have been hampered by such stupidity. Greatest Contributions Drew returned to Howard University as chief surgeon at Friedman's Hospital, where he mentored a new generation of medical students and residents while campaigning against the exclusion of black doctors from local medical societies, medical specialty organizations, and the American Medical Association. He considered his training of young black surgeons to be his greatest contribution to medicine. You can see a photo of that up here. There he is, teaching these soon-to-be black doctors here. Drew continued to be recognized for his achievements, but his life was tragically cut short in the early hours of April 1st, 1950, when he was just 45 years old. Drew was driving to a medical conference in Alabama when he fell asleep at the wheel near Burlington, North Carolina. The car flipped several times, leaving Drew with life-threatening injuries. He was rushed to a local hospital, which had segregated wards, but a shared emergency room. Three white doctors gave Drew transfusions and consulted with doctors at nearby Duke University Medical Center to try to save his life but his injuries were too serious to overcome. In November 1950, seven months after his death, the American Red Cross announced that it would omit the racial designation once required of blood donors. What an incredible person, right? This is not a person that we learn about in school, but someone that changed millions of people's lives, saved millions of people's lives, for sure, right? The articles here about how the hospital was segregated and probably, um, you know, led to his death, but it's probably debatable. Also, don't fall asleep at the wheel. It's very dangerous. Don't be, you know, make a choice. It's very tragic what happened. But that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And again, in like a week or so, I'll be getting a new issue and I'll be putting out a video for channel members so that they can pick an article. If you want to be part of that, you can join now. You don't want to miss out. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you found this video to be relaxing and educational. And I hope that you have a good, good